We're going to get started. Welcome, Leeds, and I'm Judy from the Association of Lifelong Learners, and we're here to listen to Leeds tell us about what we haven't seen yet. Go ahead, Leeds. Well, it's, uh, I, I have uh, a couple of things I have to explain. First of all, when I was talking to Jodine, I got carried away, and I could think of all these wonderful things I've seen lately that I keep finding out from my friends because there are so many good things out there. Well, there's so many terrible things. There's so many venues to go look that they often didn't know what I was talking about. They'd never seen what I saw. So when I was talking to Jodine, I got so excited. I said, well, we can talk about Netflix. We can talk about HBO. We can talk about um, um, uh uh, TCM, Turner Classic Movies. And then when I got started, I realized, no, I really, I started with Netflix and I stayed with Netflix. There's um, nothing other than that. If you don't have Netflix, okay. If you're looking for a good place, I, we would love it. We really think it's superior. I can get uh, Amazon, I can get Disney Plus, I can get a variety of things, but Netflix satisfies us the most. Now to begin, I have a disclaimer and I have notes, okay? I have these notes because I'm old <laughs> and I need to remember what I want to say. Also, these notes will be available to you if you contact Judy. Um, they can send you a copy of them. So not now necessarily, but if there are any that you think you'd like to see in the future and you um, uh, can't remember what it's about, or I can't remember the title of it, that's a place to go. I have a disclaimer, and I'll read it. None of these movies have been selected with your personal sensitivities in mind. Foul language, nudity, controversy, and violence may be in some. But then again, they may not be. Proceed with caution if you are sensitive. Now, I had so many, I thought I'd just confuse people if I didn't try to get things organized. So I've divided them into groups. And the first group is what I call good guys, bad guys. And on that list, the first one that I include is a movie called The Irishman. Now, The Irishman was a nickname for um, the, um, the gentleman by the name of Frank Sheeran. And he was a hitman. His whole life, he killed people. In fact, there was a code that when you wanted to make sure that you were talking to the right person, uh, people would say to him, I hear you paint houses. <laughs> and I hear you paint houses. It could very well be a reference to the splattered blood um, that is changing the atmosphere of the room. But this is based on a real life hitman. At the end of his career, that's where it begins. Uh, Martin Scorsese directed it. Al Pacino and uh, Robert De Niro are in it. And they're two superb actors. They have a great history already with Martin Scorsese. So there's a lot of um, comfort in the way they work together. The interesting thing to me about this is that it covers a lot of... Um, the Irishman's Life, who was played by De Niro, and Jimmy Hoffa, who was played by Al Pacino. And the thing is, they're too old to be young on screen, but not anymore. The computer is totally able to reduce your age. They get rid of wrinkles and sags and bags and jowls and all of this stuff. I'm thinking of getting one of those computers, but I haven't yet. So that what happens during the course of the movie is you see De Niro as a young man and you see him age logically till you get toward the end of the movie. And the end of the movie is with the two men at their age and the Irishman is friends with Hoffa, very good friends. 
And so the question comes, did he really have anything to do with Hoffa's disappearance? And of course, the only way you'll know is to watch the movie. Godless is also under, but it shouldn't be under good guys, bad guys. It should be under good gals, bad guys. Godless is the name of a town. Well, um, the town is actually La Belle, New Mexico, okay? The beauty. And Godless is the town of essentially all women. The men have been killed off. There is a marauding gang in the area that gets what it wants when it wants it. And so there are very few men, but the women run the town extremely well. Now, the gang that I talked about is uh, headed up by that terrible bad man from Chelsea, Michigan, um, Jeff Daniels. He's the, um, he's the leader of the gang. And they regularly, because they have been um, I don't know how to say it. They've been uh, deceived. They are looking for a traitor, somebody who didn't do right by them. And so they keep coming back to the town. Of course, the town full of women is a great attraction as well, but the women stand on their own two feet and they protect themselves and keep themselves very good. You have... Um, Oh, let me see. You have seven episodes to finally get to the end and see what happens to this gang of marauders. Um, they're looking for a traitor, but the question is always a traitor to whom? And it's I found it fascinating. So did my wife. And I have to preface things. If it gets very bloody, she has to look away. And I have to say, okay, you can look back. <laughs> and uh, sometimes she... It's not even blood. She just suspects, oh, something gruesome is going to happen and looks away. Um, this has moments, but the whole seven episodes put together are just, um, they're a, a, a treat for a week. The High Women. Now, The High Women is, again, based on real life experience. They, we have questionable cops who are chasing questionable crooks. Kevin Costner and Woody Allen play these questionable cops. They're at the mm, end of the line, pretty much. And they are out there looking for some really terrible criminals. Now, the question is, are these old fogies going to get the criminals known as Bonnie and Clyde? Now, this is based on true story. The over-the-hill police are Texas Rangers. And this was before the FBI. It was before forensics. It was an untold story, essentially. But it's fascinating to watch these two old Texas Rangers after the hottest gangsters of his time. Really worth watching. I loved it. And then finally, the last, no, not the last in Good Guys, Bad Guys, second to the last. This one is called The Departed, and it's an older film, 2016. Uh, it's another Martin Scorsese film. In fact, he won his Oscar for it, been nominated over and over and over and over, and he never wins, but he did for The Departed. I wasn't sure I'd ever get to see it in the regular theater, because in 2016, that's where we were going to see movies we wanted to see. Um, but we were on a plane coming back from Europe and it was in the little viewer in front of me. There you go, Kay Breckenridge. I watched The Departed on the screen as smaller than my laptop screen. Uh, it's a oh, wonderful movie, well worth his, his Oscar. It stars uh, Jack Nicholson, Leonardo DiCaprio, and uh, Matt Damon. And the story is a great, a great cat and mouse story. You have the police and you have a gang. The gang is run by uh, Jack Nicholson. Now, the police have a plant in the gang. And the gang has a plant in the police. And at one point, the police and the gang 
tell one of their people connected with the other that they must find the spy, the crook, the mole. And that's where the story becomes fascinating because it gets so intricate and you sit there trying to figure it out. And, oh, you've got, no, no, that didn't happen. Got, no, that didn't happen. It's really excellent called The Departed. Watching that, you can see um, Scorsese, why Scorsese has influenced literally dozens and dozens of contemporary directors. And the last one is the oldest of the movies I'm going to suggest. It is um, uh, Training Day, stars um, Denzel Washington and Ethan Hawke. And it's a little touchy, especially considering our times. When I look at these movies, and I didn't select any of them with contemporary times in mind. I was just looking at stuff that was fascinating and extremely well done um, that I would be pleased to recommend to people. Training Day amounts to Denzel Washington being a seasoned veteran cop. And Ethan Hawke is a rookie. And Ethan Hawke gets assigned to Denzel Washington to learn the ropes. And what winds up happening is exactly what you'd expect. The experienced guy is showing the younger guy what happens. He warns him ahead of time. He actually lets him get into trouble himself. So he'll have to get out of trouble himself. All of this is fine. And it's everyday cop work. But it is an everyday cop work. Because there is a point at which you discover, I mean, it's visible. Denzel Washington is not your customary policeman. He does not do things always by the book. And this puts a pressure on the rookie who's working with him. I mean, he sees things he doesn't want to believe. But he also sees things as he's amazed at. And the results of this seasoned veteran are wonderful. So it's this cop versus cop. It's sort of like student versus teacher. At what point does the teacher, does the student stand up and say, excuse me, Mr. Bird, that's not true. Or you shouldn't do it that way. And this, the movie is, is fascinating. It's, it's thrilling, got lots of good thrills in it. Uh, but it's also filled with ethical dilemmas, which turn out to be until recent, I mean, turn out to be, con turn out to be topical, okay? Didn't select it for that reason. I selected it because it's a good thriller. If you want a good thriller, watch it. Forget the topical aspect of it. Now, we'll leave the good guys, bad guys, and go someplace with feel-good movies. I have them called feel-good because I don't find very many comedies I like. I don't like people acting silly. I don't like people acting dumb. I don't like watching something where a person, you just say to them, well, why did you do that? You know, it's like, it's like those horror movies where a person goes down into the basement and never bothers to turn on the light. You have to be stupid to do that. The light switches right there, go flick, and then you won't be scared. But they never do. And in so many comedies, they're silly. They're foolish people doing foolish things. So I selected some feel-good movies. And the first one was a surprise because Margaret and I had passed over it several times. Oh, we don't want to watch this about fishermen, fishermen, fishermen. No, we don't. No, we don't. But then we actually tuned in to The Fisherman's Friend. Oh, it's wonderful. It's charming. It's delightful. It takes place in Cornwall, England, and it deals with men who fish in the Atlantic Ocean. They're very seasoned fishermen, and they're tough. They live a tough life. But when they are not fishing, they're in the local pub singing great shanty songs. And they are superb. And into their town, just on vacation, because... Cornwall is a place where a lot of people vacation in England. There come a group of men from London. Now, they are um, talent searchers. One of the men owns a recording company. And in the bar, they hear the, the fishermen sing. 
And the head of the recording company says to this newcomer, one of the young hanger-ons that's with him, why don't you stay here and see if you can get them to sign a contract? And off he and the other buddies go. Well, that's what he tries to do. And it's very hard. First of all, they think they, first of all, he's from London. Why should they pay any attention to a person from London? That city versus country. And additionally, he gets himself sort of enamored of the young woman who works in the pub. And that's fine, but they don't know if they like the city guy hanging around with one of their girls. And then when he approaches them, it's nonsense. Don't be silly. They think he's joking. How could anybody from London want to hire us? We're fishermen. Sure, we sing. But that's all. We just sing. Well, it's back and forth, and it's really complicated and delightful between the guy trying to get the contract signed, between the fishermen, and out of the fisherman group, you find a spokesperson, you find several individual characters, and it, it works very well, and then you get to the end, and it's all a joke, but the question is, who is it a joke on? It turns out the recording company did this as a joke to the newcomer, try and get these, these uh, rural singers to sign a contract. Are you kidding? We're not gonna, not gonna hire them. But the joke comes after the singers have finally decided, yes, I wanna be, we'll do it, we'll try it. And so the joke continues as to who it's really on. Is it on the fishermen? Is it on the recorders? Is it on the young man and the young lady? But all the while, it's superb music, charming people, beautiful scenery. You can't help but love it. It's a great film. I posted it on Facebook. At least 25 people thanked me. They watched it and they loved it. They didn't like it. They loved it. And probably another 15 said they'd already seen it and wasn't it great. So it's not just my recommendation. There are other people who like it as well. Another feel good. Our souls at night. Sounds sort of creepy maybe, but it's wonderful. Jane Fonda, Robert Redford. Now, they worked together first time 50 years ago, making a movie called Barefoot in the Park. It was Robert Redford's first movie. It was Jane Fonda's, maybe her third movie. So, like Scorsese, De Niro, and Pacino, Redford and Fonda had a history that sort of makes the blending of their performances that much stronger, that much more natural, that much more comfortable. And here's basically what it's about. Jane Fonda is a widow. Robert Redford is a widower. And now you think it's going to fall into the usual romance, right? Mm, not really. See, they do meet. They do share times. They do share their history. They talk a little. They talk a lot. And they discover that for each of them, one of the worst things about being, about losing their partner is going to bed at night and finding an empty space beside you and getting up in the morning and finding that space still empty. Do you think it's possible that two adult experienced people could maintain a platonic relationship, each occupying an empty space for the other, literally. It's a romance. And I can say that, it's not vulgar in any respect, but how often do we really get a true romance anymore? There always has to be some edge put into it. But this is a sweetheart of a movie. I saw this one quite some time ago. This one, uh, the Intouchables, Intouchables, in, not um, Intouchables, okay? It's a French film. It's got subtitles and it's worth the read. So get it 
watch it and read it. It's a slightly older movie, 2012. We did see it in a big theater as well um, as seen it uh, here, um, here on Netflix. A very, very wealthy man because of a, dis of a disease is basically paralyzed from the neck down. He cannot attend to himself at all. And he is, he's in need of what you could call a nurse, but not certainly not a nurse, a companion. Find the label. They don't have the label, they use companion. And so the people who work for this wealthy man and the people who are sort of in charge of his life, he still runs everything, but they help him, they help him run everything. They bring in all these people for him to interview. He insists on interviewing the person who's going to be his nurse and he insists on a man. They bring in all these people, he rejects one after the other, and an immigrant African comes in to answer an ad he read in the paper. When you look at the appearance, the dress of the other applicants and you look at him, well, you have a tendency to shake your head the way the, his, um, the way his helpers are shaking their head, this will never happen. And of course, that's who he hires. And he hires because, because that man has, is so open, is so free. And as you watch this, the connection between the two of them gets so solid get so beautiful, get so caring. You make discoveries that the poverty that this immigrant African lives in, in Paris. And of course you can see the life that this wealthy man lives and you get to see them mesh. And well, before it's through, you get to see them have the most phenomenal effects on each other's lives and on you as well. One review <clears throat> said, you'll laugh, you'll cry, and you'll cringe, but in my mind, it's worth every second. The last of the feel-good movies <laughs> depends upon how you feel. It's called The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. It's a Coen Brothers movie. It's odd, it's odd, it's odd. Every Coen Brothers movie is odd. It's a series of vignettes, there are what, I think six. And they go from the absurd to the profound. Little stories that involve Buster Scruggs. But what the Cone brothers are doing is if you are of an age where you saw Westerns long before they became these great big things, but if you saw Gene Autry or Roy Rogers or Sunset Carson or some of those people, or if you as a kid watched Westerns on Saturday, this is where they're going. And they are having a great time. Well, I guess I'll have to say making fun of. They're having a great time pointing out the absurdities of these Westerns. How they could be so harebrained and yet we buy into them. <laughs> and it's a charm. In the same token, it's odd. And it may help you to understand the Coen brothers. Here are two movies that they did that you might recognize. One is the movie Fargo, okay? And let me point out so that you recognize oddity, the Coen brothers oddity. Remember the chipper, the wood chipper scene? You ain't seen nothing like that in movies, okay? Before the Coen brothers think, oh, this is a cool way to do this. <laughs> That was so good, it went into a television series. And the other movie is, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? If you haven't watched that, either one of those could be on the list. They're really excellent. But if you watched either one, you know what I mean when I say the Coen brothers do odd stuff. Now, my next category is real people. 
D-I-G. Dig is based on true events, and it's a movie that brings out the archaeologist in all of us. And you may sit there thinking, I don't have any archaeology in me. Mm. Well, let's look at it this way. Um, do you like to solve mysteries? I think most of us do. Like um, maybe what lies under those three mounds on the estate of this woman in Sussex, England? Unnatural mounds that don't belong there. Why are they there? And what might be in them? Or maybe you like to see the little guy take on the big guy. And what you have is the British Museum going after this old codger of an archaeologist, homemade archaeologist, and battling to take away his discovery. Or maybe you just like making discoveries, but it's excellent. It's excellent. And it's 2021. It's brand new. And Carrie Mulligan, uh, Joseph Fiennes, uh, superb actors. Carrie Mulligan is just, I'm amazed at her time and time and time and time again. It's a name you want to remember if, that, if you ever find that just names will draw you to want something. She is always superb. Dig. You dig it? Manx. M-A-N-X. If you watch Turner Classic Movies, TCM, the principal intro. The principal MC is, I forgot his first name, Benjamin, Benjamin Mankiewicz. He is a son, grandson of writers for the movies, scripts for the movies during the golden age of Hollywood. His father, his grandfather, numerous Oscars, his folks won numerous Oscars, had all sorts of nominations. Okay, they're the Mankiewicz family. Now, the movie's called Manx because the movie is about Herman J. Mankiewicz, this current guy on TCM, his granduncle, I believe it is. Now, Citizen Kane is usually at the top of any list of great movies made. And Orson Welles' Road to Glory with that, his first movie. The question this movie looks at is how much of it is his movie? <laughs> well, the credits say written by Orson Welles and Herman J. Mankiewicz. But how much did Orson Welles write? And how much did Mankiewicz write? It's fascinating. It really is so good. I love movies. And so maybe that's one of the reasons it's fascinating to me. And I, I adore Citizen Kane. If, uh, if in May we get to do something together um, on uh, watching movies from the golden age of Hollywood, which I had talked to Jodine about the possibility of looking at the movies, not looking at the movies, but how to watch the movies from 1935 to 1955. That's basically the golden age. And there are certain things, if you know about that time period, you know what to find in movies that you haven't seen there before. You know what movies to watch that you have skipped before because you never knew this kind of thing happened. And it's almost, it's a formula and it's enjoyable. And so that's why, I mean, I love Citizen Kane and we would talk about that at that time. But what this movie does, what Manx does, it takes, it goes after the real life truth. It looks, it takes into glamor of how old Hollywood, the sleaze of old Hollywood, the fascination of old time Hollywood. And it's not just Hollywood because Citizen Kane is based on William Randolph Hearst, who was the media magnet at, in the entire United States at that time. So the influence back and forth is amazing. And you're not just dealing with Hollywood, you're dealing with William Randolph Hearst as well. And it's fascinating. Now it's in black and white. Why? Because that's, <laughs> it's about movies that were usually made in black and white. 
And maybe that's something we would talk about next month if we get to do this next month. Black and white, in black and white movies from the golden age, are in more colors than you can imagine. The costumer designing the dress for Betty Davis to wear, the red dress for her to wear at the ball in Jezebel, designed and built seven costumes because red dresses didn't look red in black and white. <laughs> That's the kind of thing that they did back then. It was phenomenal. But you'll see, they do the same kind of black and white in Manx. I found it fascinating. Another one fascinating, very topical, the social network. Facebook. Now, where'd that come from? You know, crawl out from under a rock or did it descend on a cloud from heaven? <laughs> or could it possibly have been a bunch of horny guys looking for dates? The social network is really excellent. It's a fascinating look at the true story and the battles, the battles, because once the social network, once Facebook takes off for the, these few guys in college that have put it together, then who owns it? Who's going to profit by it? And the film takes you into the battle behind that. And it's, it's, it's just one of those movies, once again. Here you're seeing something that affects your life, whether you watch Facebook or not. It affects your life because it affects this country so strongly. And you get to see the battle. You get to see what goes on. You get to see the birth of Facebook. And then you get to see the change of Facebook much closer to the face that we have now. And here's a sidebar. An interesting part of watching The Social Network <laughs> is to watch an actor by the name of Army Hammer. No, he's not baking soda. I did not say arm and hammer. His name is Army Hammer. He plays twins. And to watch the same man play twins on the same screen at the same time is fascinating all by itself. Okay, and the last of the real people films I'm talking about is Spotlight. And Spotlight, well, Spotlight is a movie about the free press doing only what the free press can do. We join reporters from the Boston Globe as a team of reporters delves into the allegations of abuse in the Catholic Church in Boston. We join a brilliant cast in a true story as they encounter dangers, they encounter politics, fears, threats, personal conflicts, superb cast, very well made, one of the highest grossing movies of 2015. So it tells you somebody had to like it. <laughs> and while you watch it, the main team of investigators, this guy, he's not, he's not, he's not the lead of the investigators, but he's got dark hair. He's nice looking. He's not quite as tall as the others. His name is Brian Darcy James. He's done lead roles in Broadway all over the place, and he's from Saginaw, Michigan. That's the last of real people. Now I'd like to go into the Black experience. Right now, there are more superb movies featuring Black performers and dealing with situations that are intrinsic to Black life. And so I found three of them that I think um, you'll find enjoyable and worthwhile. Self-made. You all remember Madam C.J. Walker? <laughs> I don't either. Never heard of her? Well, get this. Madam C.J. Walker is the first American woman ever to become a millionaire. Now you notice I didn't say first African-American woman. 
She's the first woman of any color ever to become a mil an American millionaire. Now, how does she get there? Well, she starts out as a washerwoman and she climbs that ladder of success with problems and obstacles every, every place she can possibly encounter them. But she keeps going. And it's a battle. But you see, nobody is offering hair products to African Americans. And African American hair, maybe you know it, maybe you don't know it. It takes high maintenance. And there's nothing out there until Madam C.J. Walker decides she's going to put something out there. Now, this is a fictionalized story based on truth. It's, it's, it's inspiring. It is so good. And it stars Olivia Spencer. Now, if you don't know her, watch this movie, get to know her, and then watch a movie just because Olivia's in it. My God, she's good. And she's got a whole litany of movies already out there. I don't know how you could not possibly just be wiped off well, you can't be wiped off the screen, uh, but you could be um, just delighted by that woman. Okay, another Black experience is Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. It has nothing to do with a woman's buttocks, okay? <laughs> I think that's the first mistake people make when they hear that title. And I think August Wilson used the title on purpose. But you see, Ma Rainey was a jazz singer in the 1920s and 30s. And in the 1920s, there were two jazz, uh, two dance crazes. One was the Charleston and the other was the Black Bottom. And Ma Rainey is the woman who made the Black Bottom famous, both as a style of song, but also as a style of dance. And this is her story, her brief story, not her life story. She is in Chicago hot Chicago in a hot recording room where she is trying to lay down one track of her music, roasting to death and having no voice over what goes on. She's the lady in charge. She's always been the lady in charge. She creates the music. By that, I mean right from the bottom on up. She's the one who's made it famous. And there are these other people telling her what she can do and what she can't do. And then she asks for Coca-Cola. And the whole thing comes to a head. It is so good. It is currently, currently, right now, nominate, nominated as one of the best pictures of the year by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. It has three of the actors nominated as best and, uh, of act for acting awards. One of them's Viola Davis, and I'll mention her. She, again, she and Olivia Spencer, go see anything they're in. They are such good actresses. And then Chadwick Boseman, he's deceased. For a long time, he had been dying from cancer, and nobody in the Hollywood circle knew it. He is literally... Shortly after he completes this movie, he dies. He plays a jazz musician. He's splendid. In fact, the entire cast is great. The music is great. And it's not about her performing, but you do see her perform, sometimes in the studio and sometimes to let you know where she came from. Now, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom is written by August Wilson, who wrote eight plays about life in the, Ameri in the American Negro's family for eight different decades, okay? They're superb plays. This one's the only one that doesn't take place in Pittsburgh. It's called the Pittsburgh Cycle. This one takes place, Ma Rainey takes place in Chicago. If you saw the movie Fences last year, year before, with Denzel Washington and Viola Davis, you saw one of the Pittsburgh cycle. I can, and Denzel Washington, <clears throat> pardon me, has undertaken the task of filming all eight of them. And I can hardly wait. They, 
August Wilson's a brilliant writer and you get to see, you get to see humanity in a way that we often don't get to see it. Excuse me, help yourselves to whatever you have. I knew Kay would have it. Oh, Carol does who? And the rest of you, I can't see. I hope you're enjoying yours. <laughs> the last one is a tough one. It too is nominated as best picture of the year this year. It's the trial of the Chicago seven. It is a tough movie to watch. At times it feels as if it is happening today or at least could happen today. It's written and directed by a brilliant, brilliant writer, director, Aaron Sorkin. And the film follows the Chicago Seven. I don't know if you remember them. I clearly do. The Chicago Seven. And they are arrested. They are, first of all, they are a group of anti-Vietnam War protesters. They are charged. By, with conspiracy and crossing state lines with the intention of inciting riots at the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago, a real life incident. Sorkin is the kind of writer who investigates in great detail. I will just tell you, it's a superb cast right on down the line one after the other. Um, Alan Sorkin, you may know him if you remember the television series, The West Wing or Newsroom with Jeff Daniels, that guy from Chelsea, who was, you know, um, with the godless. Um, oh, and a movie that he wrote, um, adapted the script for, uh, A Few Good Men a Tom Cruise movie. That's the man who has written and directed this. As I said, it can get very intense. The courtroom logistics are astounding. What goes on, you shake your head. And I don't know, I'm gonna trust Sorkin to be basically truthful. And actually the court record is there. You can take it right out of what was said and what was done. You even get the interesting thing because most of the Chicago Seven are African-American. Abby Hoffman is not. And the relationship then again with their lawyers, his lawyer, where's that guy's lawyer? Um, and the judge is a wacko. Really excellent. Frank Mangella is superb as the judge. You just want to beat him up. But it's a good film. Really good. And as I said, it can be very touchy. Um, it can be hard for some people to watch. So on a lighter note, we'll go to documentaries. When I was teaching a movie class in high school, not when I was in high school, to high school. When I was teaching a movie class, I found that when I said we were going to go into documentaries, the kids went into a tailspin. It was always, oh, it, uh, they don't have stories. They don't have actors. They don't have to shut up. I'll show you what they have. And I would, and they would wind up loving them. You just have to know what you're going to look for. And I have, <laughs> oh, I have two that are just charmers. My octopus teacher, my octopus teacher is a delight. There's this guy in South Africa who, he doesn't scuba, he snorkels in the reefs not far from his home. And snorkeling, he encounters an octopus. Now the whole thing about the octopus is that we are, have such misconceptions of what they're like. You know those big monsters you see in old movies would wrap their arms around a ship and drag it down the bottom? First of all, those wouldn't have been octopus, they would have been squid. But beside the point, that's not what this is about. This is about real octopuses, octopi, octopods, three plurals, octopuses, octopi, octopods. You can have whichever one you like.
Okay, so this guy is down there and he encounters an octopus by accident. I don't say he stumbles across him because he's swimming, but it is pretty much stumbling across him. And the octopus and he have a time learning tolerance for each other, but they eventually do. And then he learns so much from this octopus. It's delightful, fascinating, amazing. And the octopus starts learning from him so that the octopus learns to do things with him. And before it's through, they have become the best of friends. She is so enamored of him in an octopus sort of way, and he's enamored of her. And their life, her life story takes on development because he meets her, I assume, I don't know much about octopus growth in that respect, but he meets her pre-puberty and leaves her post-puberty. Okay. Um, I just can't tell you how charming it is. And there's not no real danger. Don't let the octopuses bother you. And there are a couple others. Now, the second one, 50 of the best minutes you can have watching on Netflix, Dancing with the Birds. And I don't mean Leeds Bird and his wife, Margaret Bird. Okay. I don't know where to start. You see, it's about these guy birds who have the most extraordinary, surprising, beautiful, stunning, funny tail feathers that you'll ever see. And they use those tail feathers to court some of the homeliest, ugliest, plainest birds you'll ever see. It takes place almost exclusively. These are birds of paradise. And if you think you've seen the bird of paradise, you haven't because there are dozens of them. It takes place in Costa Rica, except for one trip, quick trip over to um, New Guinea and then back to Costa Rica. I couldn't believe my eyes. One bird has to build a space. I would say I don't know, do you have like a 10 by 12 room in your house somewhere? A space that big. It's, it's room size of nothing. Uh, and then he has to court the bird, the female in that space. It, and the feathers and what they do with the feathers and what they do while dancing. It sounds like it might be nothing. It isn't. It's charm itself. I can't believe anyone wouldn't like it. And certainly laugh. You don't have to, you don't have to think they're very swift doing that, but it works for most of them. The next documentary is brand new. 2021, it's Operation Varsity Blues. And it's about the college admission scandals, which have barely cooled off. And it's a full-scale treatment giving you background detail that you never saw on TV. And there are glimpses of what happened at all points and all points of view. And some of the specifics just leave you shaking your head. I found it interesting just to watch something so timely. It, ha it has a strange factor. It has one actor. They use Matthew Modine, Modine, Modine. I don't know. I've never met him. He's Modine or Modine uh, to play one of the characters. And so the scenes that he in are constructed, but a lot of the other things are actual uh, footage of what took place. And of course, it's all about this, co this person, <clears throat> excuse me, who gets unqualified, potentially unqualified students to qualify to get into colleges. Um, and another interesting thing, it is so recent that one of the men, let me see if I can find his name. I have his name someplace. One of the more, it's not there, it's not there. Oh, come on, what's his name, John? Well, anyway, one of the men who is in, his daughter and he are involved in the movie, He's suing the movie because he said he did not pay to have his daughter in. 
uh, admitted uh, illegally, uh, unethically, or both. But he has instead, um, uh, she got in on the, under the right pretext. And I think it's so interesting that they can have this. Um, they can have this event right now. And it is, um, it's, um, you can watch a, the video of it, a 2021 video, and you can tell that some of it's not true. But the next documentary is true. I was hoping to find his name, but you won't know him anyway. So next documentary is true. It's called Crip Camp. Crip is short for cripple. And don't jump to conclusions before you really watch the film for 15, 20 minutes. It's a summer camp for crippled teenagers. And the crippled teenagers named the camp. They called it Crip Camp. And if you've ever known or if you've ever had a physical, um, some kind of flaw, it's easier to point it out yourself before somebody can point it out and make fun of you. So they go to Crip Camp and you can't say anything about it. And it's true. It's a camp in the 1970s. In the first half of the movie are videos that they took themselves, that their folks took, of these handicapped, oh, don't use that word anymore, ladies. These challenged children, teenagers, acting like teenagers, behaving like teenagers, making out like teenagers in a place where they're not ridiculed, in front of people who can't feel superior. Oh, it makes you feel so good. And then the second half of the movie takes some of the children from Crip Camp into adulthood. And this is the part I, I, I was just stunned by and pleased by. I wanna say it right. It takes some of the kids into the adult roles they played in bringing about the Americans with Disabilities Act. These kids in Crip Camp made a huge change in our country. I belong to a community theater and we are ADA. That means we are accessible. Every part of the theater is accessible to somebody who may be in a wheelchair or who may uh, be on crutches or whatever uh, assistance they may need. And to me, it meant a lot because uh, the Crip Camp takes place in the 70s. The Disability Act comes after that. But in the 70s, uh, my mother could not walk very far. Uh, she was in her 80s. Uh, she could walk a bit in the house, but if we went out any place, it was in a wheelchair. And I remember so many times getting my mother into the wheelchair and wheeling her down off. We're going to leave this block. We're downtown so she can look in store windows. She wasn't going to buy anything. Um, we're leaving this block and I come to an eight or nine inch curb. And I would have to take her and tip her back of the wheelchair, back on the big wheels and back and lower her kabump down that nine inch curb. Then straighten out the wheelchair, we'd cross the street, turn the wheelchair around, tip back once again and haul her up that nine inch curb. And I see those recesses and curbs today. Oh my man, they make me feel good. And I can't believe that Crip Camp wouldn't make all of you feel very good. It's a lovely movie. Okay, that's the end of what I have to say. And I probably talked too long, but I'm going to give you a quick thing here and I won't get so involved. Sometimes, sometimes you want more than one shot. Okay. And some of the things I've talked about are more than one shot. But Margaret and I have found that every so often we'll lock into a series that we think is exceptional. And it, the series we like about them is, the series will have characters that run all the way through. 
and they carry a storyline all the way through. But each episode you watch has its own story that is complete in itself so that you're not left hanging one after the other. It's not like those serial chapter plays that we used to see in the movie theaters. Uh, tune in next week and see if um, the alligator really does eat him. Last Tango in Paris is one of those. You have an older man and an older woman. They get to know each other and they marry. And that's sweet. But they have adult children. And the adult children have grandchildren. Or they have spouses. And then they have grandchildren. And the grandchildren have problems. So do the spouses. And so do the spouses' spouses. Now, none of this is hard to take. And none of it's mean-spirited. But it's really interesting. You get to meet people that you want to come back and meet again. And sometimes you're glad it was only an hour that you spent with them. And sometimes you wish it were true. Last Tango in Paris. No, Halifax. Halifax. Oh, Halifax. Halifax. I'm not <laughs> recommending you watch Last Tango in Paris. <laughs> Did you hear Barbara's <laughs> voice? No, Halifax. <laughs> I was just trying to get in. <laughs> the second one of those, I'm going to suggest four of them to you that you might like, and they're quite different, is called The Midwife. If you haven't found it yet, you have missed one of the great treasures that, um, that I don't know, I don't know what to call it, that media has provided, that film has provided, it's a group of midwives living in London, a poor part of London. It starts during World War II. It will go beyond that into the 50s. They are midwives who live at an Anglican convent where the nuns are midwives. We encounter this fantastic array of personal stories of lives, sometimes involving the nuns, sometimes the people who live next door, sometimes the people that are having a baby. It, it's just, it is, and I know more men who, when you bring up, call the midwife, their faces lights up. And fa oh, their faces lights, their faces light up. And just now, I went off for a little while. And when somebody, when we mentioned the season was going to be starting again, this guy, he lit up like, like, like he was seeing an old friend. And that's what it is. Call the Midwife is one of the best series to ever come out of England. And that says a lot when you look at upstairs, downstairs, Downton Abbey and a multitude of others. This holds its own with all of them. It's really excellent. The Kaminsky Method. You want to meet some old friends? Michael Douglas, Alan Arkin. Michael Douglas is an actor who's too old to get jobs acting anymore. He opens an acting studio where he teaches the Kaminsky Method. His best friend is Alan Arkin. Alan Arkin was smart enough to be a producer. He's got a lot of money. But they're the best of friends. One's divorced, one's um, widow. It's it. There's no point in explaining that kind of thing to you. They, the stories are there. It's what I told you. A story between the two men runs throughout, but each episode has its own story. But one of the biggest treats that you get out of the Kaminsky method is the same treat. You get out of watching Jane Fonda act with Robert Redford, out of watching Kevin Costner act with Woody Harrelson, watching Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. These people have a history and that history creates a connection with actors that you never see with actors who've never met each other before or who have no history uh, very little history to share. These people have history and the depth to watch these old fogies, to watch these old fogies be brilliant, be charming, be funny. That in itself is very special. Last one to recommend after the Kaminsky Method, Longmere. 
a sheriff in Wyoming, bad guys, a Western good old days. It isn't at all. What amazed Margaret and me, we watched this. It looks like a Western, but it's now. This is a sheriff in modern day Wyoming, a relatively small town. There's an, a Native American casino being built. And if you know anything about casinos, you know crime comes into casinos. I don't care where they are. It happens over and over. Now, you have the normal problems of trying to maintain a city. You have those, and you also have, <clears throat> pardon me, Long Mirror's Life. Jack Taylor is an Australian actor who plays him, and he's fascinating. Uh, and that's the thread that runs throughout. Now you'll meet, you'll meet his deputies, you'll meet his lady friends, you'll meet his daughter, you'll meet all of these, but also in each episode, you get well, you, it's sort of like law and order with cowboys. That's what you get. It's so much fun and fascinating. So that's pretty much my list right there. Um, there are multitudes of things. Uh, if any names strike you as familiar, or here's what I do, and I would advise you, this is the last thing I say, and then I'm going to say goodbye. When you watch a movie, you, you heard me mention Olivia, uh, Octavia Spencer and Viola Davis and Denzel Washington and uh, Pacino and De Niro and um, Scorsese uh, and uh, Sorokin. Um, get in the habit of discovering a name connected to something you liked in a film and look for that name in advance advertisements or in lists and watch because of who's connected to it. They frequently are what's bringing the quality. It's well worth it. But these, I found delightful. I hope you see them, you find them. No, not total. All of them will be delightful. Those that aren't delightful are fascinating. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. It was really good. And I do like the Longmire series on Netflix. That was really good. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. So anyways, thank you so much. Anybody have any questions for him? Hi. Okay. Uh, hello, this is Jodine. Hi, Jodine. Hi, Leeds. What a marvelous <laughs> the time just flew by. I wanted to make sure that everyone knows that you'll be speaking to us in May, on May 20th at 2 p.m. <coughs> Excuse me. Right. Uh, the, um, I think I mentioned earlier what uh, my intention is to look at uh, movies from the golden age of Hollywood. The golden age of Hollywood is the time when studios ran Hollywood. MGM, Warner Brothers, 20th Century Fox, Paramount, um, what is it? it? It amounts to about eight big studios that determined everything. In fact, Minx is part of that, part of that story. Um, but um, there are certain things like star personas and the studios themselves. If you knew it came from MGM, you know what to look for and what to expect because MGM well, they produced a certain kind of movie. So they only took a kind of star. Warner Brothers, a certain kind of, there are those elements. You have the star persona, you have the studios, and then you have the rogues. Orson Welles was a rogue in doing um, Citizen Kane, and he pretty much stayed that way because the rest of Hollywood wasn't always happy to accept him. And when he tried to get into, well, that was what I'd talk about next time. But yes, that's what we'll look at. Um, so that I love TCM. I don't know if you do or not, but I love it. But I don't like all of it. Last night, I had the misfortune to watch the last half hour of The Pirate. What a stinky movie. Walter Slezak, Judy Garland, <laughs> and Gene Kelly cannot save that movie. It is awful. <laughs> but 
I know the kind of a lot of what I'm getting into because it's MGM. I know Walter Slezak. I know Judy Garland. I know Gene Kelly. And I know MGM. So I got what I expected. <laughs> and that's the kind of thing you might learn to do with what we're looking at in May. <laughs> this is delightful, delightful presentation. Thank you so much for sharing your enthusiasm and your knowledge and your uh, uh, vigor for life. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And Thanks, Lee. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.